This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Hi, welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Professor Daniel Keating, who is at the University of Michigan, uh, and he is in the departments of psychology, psychiatry, and, and pediatrics. And he is the author of this book here, Born Anxious, uh, The Lifelong Impact of Early Life Adversity and How to Break the Cycle. So, so Dan, um, you know, we were just talking about how this is not a self-help book, but of course we're going to get into some of the ways in which you can put this stuff to use. You know, I, I always think that so many of the books that I read, I read them from the perspective of like, you know, how to live and how we can live better lives. Um, and so we can borrow from all areas of research and, you know, your area of research here, it, it sounds like you came kind of late in life to this understanding of how epigenetics works or social epigenetics. It sounds like you were uh, called to join this, this highly interdisciplinary effort that involved psychiatry, psychology, um, you know, primatology, um, you know, uh, neuroscience and all of these other disciplines to really get at, you know, why it is that, um, people live these lives, uh, uh, what we will call anxiety or what you call, um, stress dysregulation. And this effort was really one to kind of break down this simplistic division between, you know, nature and nurture that so many of us have worked with for, for many years. So, so how did you get kind of drawn into this, this research and this research agenda, which was done primarily by CIFAR, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research? Yeah. So basically, and, and, I, and part of the story is, is in the book, but I mean, I think that the, the, the um, origin of this uh, is that uh, CIFAR is a, a organization that likes, uh, that's an international organization. It's based in Canada. And it was a really interesting idea to try to figure out how can you put together uh, a sort of uh, an intellectually uh, hefty enterprise on complicated questions, interdisciplinary questions uh, from a Canadian base because it's, you know, relatively, relatively thinner compared. To, I think now California's population exceeds Canada's, right? So it's a, so it's an interesting thing. So the question that we were uh, I was uh, tasked and asked if I would be interested in doing and worked with a few other people, um, is basically started off in the health literature is why are some people healthy and other people are not? And so you start with the numshi, well, a lot of it's genetics and so forth and so on, and maybe lifestyle. And it turns out that there's a lot of other things that matter in the social environment in which people live and in which they have grown up has a tremendous impact on lots of things, including their physical health. So to understand that, you then have to shift over and ask the question, not just about health generally, but what we came to call developmental health. What are the patterns that you see across individual lifetimes and across many individuals in populations and in societies? What are the kinds of things that make a difference? And what my background was, uh, you know, sort of more straight up developmental psychology, cognitive development, uh, Piagetian studies, that kind of stuff. And I was kind of recruited into this by the, uh, by Fraser Mustard is a gentleman's uh, name. He's uh, uh, passed away a while ago, but was a very interesting medical educator and medical researcher. Um, so he pulled this all together, uh, well, pulled us together, and we proposed then to do this. And what was very clear from the beginning Although at that point, the epigenetics revolution, for want of a better term, uh, certainly the epigenetic turn, um, was not on the agenda. This is prior to that initial work being done. But it was quite clear to us that there are things about the environment, social environment specifically, that get into or get under the skin uh, in ways that then have lifelong consequences for all kinds of outcomes, development, and health. So I want to go back to this idea of, so developmental, okay, for some reason there's an echo, we'll do it again. So I want to get back to this idea of, you know, developmental psychology, right? Um, so developmental, the whole idea behind developmental psychology is that, um, you know, the environment does matter, right? I mean, you know, Pia J, of course, you know, was a founder here where the environment does matter. Um, but um, you argue in the book that early childhood and certainly you know, kind of prenatal experience is something that hasn't really been deeply studied enough. And 
you know, there, there seemed to be this, this notion that, um, while there's some, uh, genetic, um, determinism to some, at some level, uh, the experiences, which may begin at conception and, uh, and move into kind of middle childhood, these are things that, that we didn't really understand very well. Um, so, so what caused us to kind of push back further and further into the earliest moments of, of human existence to try and uncover how our, our minds evolve over time? Well, I mean, for something that, like this, there's obviously always lots of threads and, 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 and uh, we get done have time to go through all of them. But I think one of the, the way this mystery in my mind at least begins to get unpacked is that, um, there's a lot of, 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 of human uh, health literature, uh, social epidemiology and so forth. And there are a lot of people that have worked on that end of things. Um, from which it becomes very clear that what you're looking at are characteristics that have um, th th that have the opportunity to cause this kind of uh, lifelong uh, sequence of events. And the best story, very empirically based, not a made up story, um, uh, initially comes out of some of the work of Bruce McEwen and colleagues, showing that really the best, one of the best avenues to try to understand that relationship between early experiences and long-term outcomes is the stress system, the stress response system, and, and particularly his notion of allostatic load, whereby certain kinds of things can um, uh, accumulate of a stress nature, which to which you adapt for a variety of reasons, but it leaves you with health consequences, a dysregulated stress system. Well, then the question gets pushed back. Well, what causes a dysregulated stress system? How does the social environment, okay, it's under the skin. How does it get into stress, which is it's mo kind of the most obvious avenue that it could, that it could, that it could travel. Um, and uh, so a variety of people were working on the physiological underpinnings of stress and the development of stress. Um, and uh, and then one of the you know to my mind one of the real uh, major uh, lines of work that kind of shifted how we look at this certainly my view of how things work um, came out of Michael Meany's group at McGill where uh, using a rodent model where they were able to experimentally control stress and do lots of other kinds of basic work identified a gene in in the stress response system in the glucocorticoid network in particular. Um, that was uh, negatively uh, impacted uh, by uh, a traumatic or highly stressful early experience. Uh, that that then, having uh, been uh, impacted, the epigenetic change is such that the DNA, of course, is never affected. That's why it's epigenetic. But it tells that gene when to turn on and when to turn off. And so one version of this has the early high stress, even in prenatal and certainly in infancy, that that is telling the organism a story, which is this is a very dangerous environment. So you may very well want to be kind of on guard all the time, keep your stress system ready to go at the drop of a hat, so to speak. And that chronically over a life force, if that pattern is set, then you're going to get this accumulated allostatic load with all of the negative health and behavior consequences that flow from it. So it was kind of, that was the path that uncovered the mystery in my mind. Yeah. So I think in the world of, of psychology um, or in psychiatry, we, we talk about kind of functional and dysfunctional. We talk about kind of normal and abnormal psychology. We talk about, you know, healthy and unhealthy and, uh, you know, defective ways of, of being. And, and sometimes we'll talk about what goes on in our, our, our mind you know, uh, in the same way we talk about, you know, you have a broken arm, you have a you have broken, broken mind in, in some sense. But, but I think that this, this story is a little more complex because it, it seems to be saying that, um, this is really a, a learning process, right? And it exists for a reason. There's, there's sort of a, an adaptive function behind these epigenetic, um, uh, these, these epigenetic phenomenon, right? So, you know, in evolution, we, we've got learning at the, the genetic level where essentially the, you know, the genes evolve based on changes in the environment, but it's a very slow process. Then we've got the kind of neuronal learning, which happens at a, at a much more, you know, very, very quick level. And these, these epigenetic changes are sort of like an intermediate level of, 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 of learning 
which shapes how the organism behaves and presumably is shaping them in ways that are meant to be uh, uh, adaptive. So, so how might this, you know, stress deregulation be, be adaptive? Well, first of all, maybe let's, let's maybe talk about you know, this SDR. The whole book is really about this SDR and, and you know, what do we observe in people who have this, this stress deregulation? Then maybe we can talk about kind of you know, what purpose it might serve. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Actually, let me just flip it the other way, because I think it does lead to the whole understanding of a lot of the behavior and psychology that follows from it. And I th- I'm glad you raised that because it, it often is misunderstood that it, the analogy is, is, as you're suggesting, is not really accurate to like a broken arm, something's wrong and then it heals or whatever, that what you're talking about here is an organism adapting itself to the environment in which it finds itself. So in the case of this particular one where I mean, for, you know, uh, for a mammal, the high, one of the highest stress things early on is either the mom is terrifically stressed, which releases cortisol or its equivalent into, into the womb, or that they disappear after you're born because of, you know, they, something has happened to them. The organism is tuned up to say, okay, your adaptation to survive is going to be this stress dysregulation of this hyper sort, right? This kind of hyper response sort. And it is adaptive because if it is a dangerous environment, it's going to help you stay alive, right? And if you're going to, you know, you don't wait to make sure it's a tiger in the bush at a rustle, you're off, right? You're gone. And so it is adaptive, but it comes at a cost because you're, you're kicking the stress system into overdrive lots and lots of times compared to other people or other organisms whose experience has not had that stress and they didn't need that adaptation. So it's adaptive, but it's adaptive with a cost. A a quick digression, that's also true. We have some pretty good evidence. It's also true in human populations. Whereas when we've looked at individuals who have um, uh, been resilient and and succeeded against the odds, and here I'm particularly thinking about uh, individuals, uh, some interesting research that's been coming out, uh, uh, black Americans who have succeeded beyond what their uh, social uh, socioeconomic status and against racism would have predicted. When those individuals are studied, and of course there's a lot of study going on about this to find out what those things are, one of the things that's been discovered is that that itself may come with an, a cost physiologically. That in effect, you're putting yourself out there so much and against so much resistance that it's taking a toll on your body, even though mm-hmm. in every other way that you'd look at, you're very resilient and you succeeded and so forth and so on. So it's not, you know, I think there's, I'm not saying it's a perfect analogy. We haven't done the epigenetic work on the human population, but okay. Now, how does it manifest itself? Well, the health one we can talk about later, but basically that's a straightforward story of excess cortisol being carried in the body for too long attacks other organs. And so, I mean, that that's simple, but it's not wrong either. So that that's that. The uh, We can go into more detail. But the other part on the, um, the psychology and behavior side is that particularly this variety of stress dysregulation, which is this more amped up variety, um, is, is one where it has very ne- can have very negative consequences in terms of a whole bunch of different areas of development. So if you're on the alert on the alert for threat in a constant way and you're at school trying to learn stuff, well, what are you paying attention to? You're you're monitoring your social environment to make sure that the threat's not on you. Where is your mind not being spent, your attention on learning, right? So it, it can have that consequence. Similarly in social relationships, it's very interesting, particularly looking at adolescents where a lot of this gets formed and and whatnot is that individuals who are hyper reactive to perceived, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, being disrespected and so forth, right? Um, the, the title that psychologists give to this is a hostile attribution bias. You presume mm-hmm. that the other person is being hostile to you, even if their behavior by an objective observer is neutral or or, or even positive. So you have this hostile attribution bias. So you have this reactive aggression. And what's very interesting is this reactive aggression is in many ways socially disqualifying for teens. Mm -hmm. Aggression itself is not. 
individuals who use aggression instrumentally to achieve goals are often so popular in the sense that people follow them and so forth. But a reactive aggression where it's unpredictable to your peers and they don't know when you're going to fly off the handle is definitely very negative in terms of its impact on social development. So it manifests in many of these uh, different areas, um, you know, uh, behavioral control, the ability to inhibit impulsivity, all those kinds of executive function things uh, can be uh, impacted as well as learning and a whole bunch of other developmental domains as well. So I, I teach a course on, on data science. Uh, sorry, that's another echo. Do it again. I teach a course on data science and, um, uh, you know, a lot of that course is really focused on classifiers and kind of the sensitivity of your classifiers and how you can have a classifier that's kind of too sensitive or too specific, right? And it really depends on the, the costs of, of getting it wrong. And so, so presumably, if you think about the, you know, the hostile attribution uh, error, right? Um, th this is really coming from, uh, you know, having a, a sensitive alarm system, right? And, and so, like you mentioned with the tiger in the woods, right? You know, you, you see the, the grass move and, and, and so, so presumably, um, the cost of getting it wrong in some environments is in, in one direction is very high. And in another kind of environment, the cost of getting it wrong in the other direction is, is particularly high. And so this is really a calibration question, right? It's about, you know, making sure that you have the right response function or the right level of, of, of sensitivity. And, and I guess that if, you know, if, if the, if the environment that your mother is experiencing while you're in the womb is, is the one into which you are going to find yourself, then this system presumably works pretty well. So it really just works poorly when the environment that your mother is in is different from the one that you, you en enter into. Is, is that, I mean, well, is that yeah, sort of the no, evolution? I mean, the evolutionary logic is that, you know, you, yep. there's an assumption that there's going to be, that there's some there's some predictive value, right, in the in the amount of stress that you're experiencing in, in early childhood. There's going to be some correlation between what you experience in early childhood and what you're going to experience kind of later in life. Is that, is right. that sort of the the biological um, mechanism? Yeah, very much so. So for I mean, you know, the the in a sense the epigenetic um, a mechanism, and and we're now I mean we're still very early days in understanding this. You know, there are many different genes. There are many different uh, aspects of the epigenome and so forth and so on. So, uh, so, so we, we don't know. There's a lot we don't know. And one of the things we don't know, speaking of calibration, is we don't know how much stress it takes to cause a particular kind of methylation or epigenetic mm -hmm. change, right? It's a, the whole dose response thing is something we just don't even have a clue about at this point. It would be nice to, but we don't, right? And so, so that, that calibrating, uh, is important at the, physiological level. And then the other calibration is what's the behavior that's the best one in this scenario, right? What's the best one in the scenario that you happen to find yourself in? Well, I mean, epigenetics, uh, you know, is presumably, you know, evolved in the service of pr propagating organisms. And so it doesn't particularly care what the long-term cost would be as right. long as that behavior gets you through to the point where you can pass on your genes. And increasingly, we have evidence to pass on your epigenetic markers as well. And so, or at least some of them, right? And so it's in a sense, a dumb system like that, right? It's just essentially saying, we just want to get you over the hump where you can propagate beyond that you're on your own, right? Whereas our interests as humans are now, you know, different from that. Um, I, I like to think they're more progressive and sophisticated, but they're different from just getting to that point and then you're, you know, sort of um, uh, no longer of any use. And so the, um, that that whole trajectory is one of the reasons, um, I don't mean to make a left turn here, but that's one of the reasons that much of the um, intervention or overcoming of this burden of excess stress, uh, toxic levels of stress and cortisol reactivity and so forth and so on, um, is to change the environment in which people are growing up and where they're going to live, right? If you're in a very dangerous neighborhood where bad things can happen any moment, it's to your advantage to be on this high alert all the time. It's not to your body's advantage, but it's to your probable immediate survival advantage to, to you know, to do that, or at least that's what your body thinks. And so, uh, and in some cases may be true. So, but, but the point here is that that, that, that adaptation is one that's required 
when the social environment is harsh enough to demand it. If if you had if you have a you know a, a less uh, coarse or harsh social environment, then the need for that adaptation presumably goes down, and you know you sort of ratchet in the other direction. So when the overall societal stress goes up is when I think we need to seriously yeah. worry about things. So, I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, our world is very, very different from the, the world in which our ancestors lived, right? So, um, you know, the, 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 the mortality rate was much higher. The, the rates of violence were much higher. The, the rates of, you know, uh, um, predation by, you know, <laughs> lions and tigers are presumably much, much higher. So the world really was like a pretty hostile uh, place full of enemies everywhere. And so, um, presumably if, if you took someone who, you know, who was very, uh, mindful and, 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 you know, very regulated in today's environment, you kind of sent them back into that world. I mean, they wouldn't last very long. Right. So there must, I mean, presumably there must be some range of environments in which, um, this type of, uh, short fuse, um, might've, might've helped you. So, you know, maybe in, in a prison environment or, or, you know, a real kind of lawless, um, environment without social support in, in sort of a, in an, in an anarchic, uh, in, environment, right. One perhaps that we don't see too much of in today's world, in the modern developed world, but, but, you know, there, this, there, there must've been a mismatch in the other direction as well, a potential mismatch in the other direction as well. Right. Well, I, I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that it's that, 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 you know, sort of the, there's a really interesting, very large project that I dabble in from time to time is to try to understand the ways in which the patterns of individual human development would have been enacted in and responsive to these different environments, given different, you know, fundamentally different uh, social organizations. So essentially starting out as troops, right. And, and, and having, uh, you know, the same, probably the same kind of social organization, very much as you would see in other contemporary primates, you know, of, of the higher order um, and, and uh, gradually going through, you know, sort of more and more civilization, you know, sort of towns and whatnot. I think one of the things that we have not probably, I, I, I shouldn't say we, I think that developmental, I and others who are primarily out of a developmental psychology or developmental science background have not paid enough attention to is precisely how the shaping of those broad social environments has such an enormous impact on each individual's development, right? I mean, this is not that we've never thought about it, you know, sort of my uh, um, uh, colleague that I had a chance to get to know a little bit, um, uh, Yuri Bradfenbrenner's model is bioecological model, which incorporates all of these sorts of things. We've known in a sense that, that we build those, mo we build the society to a large extent that we're going to live in, which then lets us to build, you know, different kinds of societies going forward. So, so I think that it's very clear that we're, we have a emerging, though still somewhat cloudy notion of how this impacts on individual development, but still a, even more vague notion of exactly how the social environment that we construct, how does that get into these circumstances that lead to this patterns of individual development? And you're right, it will depend on what is the circumstance that you're in. The same behavior has quite different meanings in different social contexts. And, uh, and trying to understand that and then its impact on the, on the individual is, you know, is a key line of work that I think we need to keep pursuing. Yeah. But you talk a lot about what we call kind of this, this, the stress epidemic. And, and this is, this is fascinating. I mean, it's disturbing. It's also fascinating because, you know, by any real ob objective metric of, you know, health or, um, access to food and so forth, you know, even the, the, the least privileged people in our society are probably, you know, in, in better off than, you know, the best off people in say, you know, the environment of evolutionary adaptation. And, and yet, you know, the, doesn't seem like we as a whole are, are less stressed than we were, you know, in those days. Right. I mean, it seems yeah. like the, if, if anything, you know, maybe the, you know, the, the stress, le the average stress level is constant, or, you know, if there is indeed this epidemic, it may well be that, that, you know, people are stressed, uh, even more on average than they were in, in previous uh, time periods in societies. And we certainly see it across sort of 
um, you know, cross-sectionally, there are these variations and kind of stress levels across uh, society. So, you know, if, if that's, if that's the case, you know, we have an environment where being able to, to manage stress is, is adaptive and, and yet, you know, people are not generally regulating things properly. There, there's, a, there's a, this, this, this profound mismatch between how we are being shaped and, and the world into which we, we are put. So, so what accounts for this, this kind of stress epidemic, do you think? So uh, let me first say, I think that we're, we've got pretty good evidence. I'm persuaded by it, that it is a real thing. It's not just, you know, kind of a dismissal of the younger generation as a bunch of snowflakes or something. I mean, when we measure actual physiological indicators that have been associated with excess allostatic load that are ind indicators, biomarkers of stress, that has gone up over the last 40 years. This is using national samples mm -hmm. and main sample. Uh, do we have, do we have kind of glucocorticoid samples going back that far? Like, I don't uh, think, you know, the, I mean, part of it is, um, and, and I, I, uh, I don't, I had my, myself done direct work with cortisol, but I worked with a lot of people who do that, uh, sort of stuff. And it's clear that it's, a it's a complicated process, right? So the ones that NHANES collects you can get from a blood spot, but cortisol goes up and down so much during the day, you have to have a pretty clear mm -hmm. regimen yeah. of collecting it at different points during the day, if you really want to get a, a look at it. So no, we don't have historical, um, uh, cortisol readings, although it would be fascinating if we did, but, <laughs> but, 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 uh, but no, um, and, and then also so a number of the things that are associated with stress that are stress related disorders and the CDC shows some substantial increase over the same like 40 year period or so we don't, we, again, it would be lovely to have long-term, uh, kinds of, uh, kinds of, of data on those sorts of things, but those data resources aren't, aren't out there. But when we look at that process, I'm so I basically I'm, I'm accepting the premise. I think it's there. I think it's happening. Mm -hmm. the, then the next step would be, well, what, what is it that might be, uh, how might it uh, matter? And this, as you point out, I mean, we referred to this a long time ago in a paper called modernity's Par paradox. How could we have so much well, physical well-being and still problematic areas you know, of population health and population developmental health? And so. So one of the things that um, that I think that that we um, need to recognize is that people can feel stress not just about material insufficiency or the fear of it. I think precarity is the new term that their circumstances mm -hmm. are precarious enough that they might experience material insufficiency at any time. And so there's that, but then there's also the whole status component to it. Like, right? what where where do you stand within your your group amongst your, your other people, right. And so forth. And those are psychologically very real threats. So if you're, if you feel like you're sliding down the social ladder and, you know, and that, that you could wind up on, you know, the dreaded quote, welfare word, right. Or that you could lose your home and your family would be home and so forth. The, the, those may not be immediate material insufficiency things, but they're certainly status threats kinds of things mm -hmm. our, our psychology our identity our and i don't think it's just psychology i think there's a biological basis to that threat as well and so so you've got these two the, you have that the body can't tell the difference right if, yeah. if it feels threatened it feels threatened right um and so uh, it only has this one relatively you know i mean it's a pretty sophisticated system the stress system but overall it doesn't think too clearly right it it, it reacts um, you know, and the information coming in says you're under threat. And so if we, and, and my, my belief is that, that part of it is that we have over this particularly recent trend uh, to my mind, uh, and, and this is a bit of a harder case to make empirically, but we've tried to make a start on it is that period coincides with one of dramatic rising inequality, at least in the United States, but in the, you know, sort of the rich countries, the OECD or weird countries or however you want to refer to them. This, this sort of, uh, the market takes care of everything and it's, you know, everything can be privatized and, and you're in a sense, it, you're dispensable, right? You're, you know, as a, you don't really have rights as a member of the society. It's only as, uh, your contract allows it to have. Uh, and so, and so that whole, 
acceleration in that. I think, you know, it, kids today are feeling way more pressure about what kind of a university can they get into, right? And the stories that it begins in, you know, what preschool are you going to get into in certain uh, uh, social contexts or other kinds of things. And parents worrying that their kids w are not going to be as well off, that they're not even going to be able to hold the position that the parents have attained, which suggests that that is going on in terms of social mobility in, in the U.S. and in the West generally, but not as much. And so those those factors come in through the, you know, uh, self-perception uh, status kind, right? What people often refer to as socioeconomic status, as opposed to actual material insufficiency or threat of it, you know, which is more to do with what are the material resources that you have uh, and so forth. And so the that I think is the is the root of this. And I, you know, I, I'm currently, uh, it's not really a follow up to Born Anxious, but I'm working on a book now of like, well, now that we've seen what a global catastrophe can can do, you know, we better really rethink how we're organizing things because mm -hmm. we're, this epidemic may seem pretty, the stress epidemic may seem pretty paltry in comparison to what's coming, come, maybe coming down the line in terms of more like a stress pandemic, that everything is kind of needs immediate fixing or else it's an existential threat. Um, and so I think figuring out how to deal with that, what are we, how do we think about those sorts of things? It is where the solution lies. The self-help part's still there because while we're sorting that out, we don't want ourselves and our families to be victimized by this without any defenses. So we need individual solutions as well. But I think the bigger picture is probably much more of a, of a large picture around mm -hmm. how we are organizing, choosing to organize our society. Well, I think there's been a lot of literature, there's a lot of research on the impact of socioeconomic status or, you know, status in general on, on health, on long-term health. And, and, you know, particularly with the kind of stress as a, as a, as an agent there, um, you know, you referenced the Whitehall study, right. Which is now probably 50 years old. I mean, I know they've, they've done, you know, new versions of, of the Whitehall study, um, where they found a direct and very strong correlation between kind of status within a, a bureaucracy and um, life expectancy and all sorts of other health outcomes. There's been a ton of studies that show um, that your immune system is uh, weaker if you're in a lower socioeconomic status. Or, or actually, it, it I think it correlates with early childhood socioeconomic status as much as anything else. Um, and I think this this kind of this kind of makes sense, right? Especially in a world where I mean, evolutionarily, it, it, you, it makes sense where your reproductive success was was in uh, in large degree a function of your status, particularly if you were male, and and so um, you know it became incumbent and super important to kind of escape that low status. But but I think we, what you're highlighting is that it's not simply the impact of being low status, but it's also the precarity of your status, right? The, the danger that you might fall into low status. And so kind of stable status is, is in some ways better than unstable status. I, I think I saw some research by one of your colleagues at the University of Michigan that looked at um, the impact of uh, when the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the male life expectancy dropped by about eight years and female life expectancy remained relatively unchanged. And I think that was primarily due to the precarious nature of of, of status. So even though only 20% of the people can be in the bottom 20%, no matter what you do, your, your probability or perceived probability of entering into that low status condition can, can vary over time. Right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a further interesting, uh, twist on the, on the Soviet union, uh, decline of the, of the male longevity, um, was that it was it differentiated within which part of the Soviet Union. So in mm -hmm. fact, that impact was very dramatic in Russia, but in fact, it didn't occur at all in what is now the Czech Republic. And partly being that, you know, if you were in Russia, you were at the top of the heap, right? Um, mm. uh, you know, as a, uh, as a male worker or whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden you've, you've been becoming reviled as this, you know, really horrible group of people, whereas, you know, in the Czech Republic, well, you were freed from the yoke and their, their health went up. So it is very sensitive to even short-term broad, you know, trends of, of the sorts of things that are, um, that are going on during, during that 
you know, sort of that, that can create those kinds mm-hmm. of things. And I think that one of the things that was particularly interesting about uh, the Whitehall stuff, uh, Michael Marmot's, uh, Sir Michael Marmot's work, is that um, it, it was done in a way that ruled out a whole bunch of other possible explanations that people had put forward, not ruled them out, but showed that they were inadequate to explain the differences. So, I mean, healthcare was not a particular issue because it was in the UK and it was universal healthcare by that time. Everybody had had access to it. Uh, they controlled for a whole bunch of lifestyle choices, right? So that if you're from the upper class, you might have less dangerous, health dangerous habits than individuals so controlled for that and so forth. And there's real no occupational differences, health differences, because they were all working in the Whitehall district in London as civil servants from, you know, file mm. clerks up through ministers, right? So, so, so presumably there wasn't a huge difference of, you know, getting, you know, hurt in the foundry or something, right? Nevertheless, doing all that, the biggest proportion of the differences by social class at social class when you were a child was unaccounted for. And so that's, you know, that in fact was a big part of the inspiration for the project that we started, um, that collaboratively we started in CIFAR. That was one of the the inspirational points of that. And I think it's very interesting. I mean, Marmot now is currently, you know, heading up a World Health Organization unit on early uh, early childhood inequalities and its impact and, and, you know, sort of continuing to make the case and with more sophisticated information th- all along that very modest investments in early childhood have huge p- positive payouts in long-term health and the economic well-being of the society because you're not spending so much on health and you have more productive people. So I think it's a, you know, it's an idea that's, holding on by fingernails in, in, you know, sort of a, uh, market ideology and ran driven world. Um, but, uh, uh, it, it's one that I, I, I keep hoping is gaining some traction. And the more that we, I keep believing against all odds of the recent past, but that, that having good comprehensible, solidly based scientific accounts for why this would be true has to help make that case at some level for a variety of people. So that putting the developmental health of the population as the central thing we should worry about, um, the more we could make that case, the better off we'd be. And I think we can make that case better the more science we have undergirding it. Well, we kind of jumped way ahead to the grand uh, sociological stuff, but but maybe let's just go right back to that that early childhood or even prenatal yeah, experience. Yeah. And and you talk about this kind of glucocorticoid feedback loop, right? Where right. you know there's this 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 self reinforcing uh, mechanism. And you know what I find as, as an economist, you know, we we like to think about uh, negative feedback loops and how you know we think about Bayesian learning and stuff like that. But but here it seems to be a system where um, there. There, there's a tendency to have positive feedback, right? So, you know, I think of it as, you, you know, the, the, the Toyota accelerator, the Toyota accelerator that gets stuck, uh, and then, you know, more things come in to make it even more stuck, right? So if you're, if you're, if you're, um, exposed to high levels of, of, of stress in the womb, and then you, you emerge from the womb, you know, you're going to be a, a more difficult child. And then that's going to make it more difficult for the parent, which is then going to lead to making the child even more difficult, which then makes them more difficult in school. And then they get the kind of feedback that makes them even more difficult. Right. So it seems to be like there's this, this reinforcement effect, um, where, where you know, where, what you, would you like to have is, is something where, okay, here's your prior. But if you emerge into a world that is contrary to these expectations, then you you should kind of, you know, gradually go back to the to the reactive function that's that's more uh, adaptive. Um, and you 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 point to some evidence that you can do this, right? You can do it, but it might require that you overcorrect, right? So you talk about this kind of super nurturing or, um, you know, uh, uh, exaggerated. Uh, support for the child, which can potentially send things back on a normal course. But the later that you do this, the more difficult it's going to going to become. Can you talk about some of the things that can be done to to uh, to a child to kind of steer them in in a more uh, adaptive direction? Oh, certainly, yeah. So, I mean, what you would want want to see happen. Let's assume we're 
we're, um, for whatever reasons, you know, from an inheritance of an epigenetic change or uh, a prenatal impact or early, very early infancy, you know, kind of the unavailability of the kind of nurturance that, that it, that's needed to do this. For whatever reason, we have, we have a, a baby who's in this situation. And, and of course, what you're dealing with there um, is, you know, it, for this particular kind of, you know, this, this uh, um, deficiency in the glucocorticoid feedback network, it's very hard to soothe. Right. It's very hard to go from an aroused, agitated state down to a more, you know, kind of uh, calm and, and, and soothing state. Now, of course, infants don't come equipped to do that themselves anyway. Like even under the best of circumstances, you know, they need to be held. They need to be rocked. They need to be cuddled. They needed, they need their biological uh, things taken care of, you know, or they will in fact continue to do that. But in that case, it's a messaging system of some sort, right? I need soothed. I need cleaned, I need fed, I need whatever, right? Um, for these uh, individuals, that's often not enough. It, you know, you do all of those things, right? And this, your, your notion of a feedback loop or a dynamic system here is exactly correct when you think of it as a dyad between a parent, a caregiver, and, and, and an infant because, uh, you know, for it in, in the, the more typical state, what we'd like to have is the more sort of Think of as the more more um, a functional state of uh, that dyadic strong, you know, good attachment and so forth. What you have is that there is the the child fussiness, the infant fussiness. Uh, the mom or dad does what needs to be done. The baby soothes, and you're now holding this kind of, you know, gorgeous, lovely, calm baby and so forth. That experience creates a huge oxytocin burst in both the parent and the infant, right? Wonderful feeling, right? Fabulous feeling. And that's what, you know, that's one of the reasons as parents, we just keep doing all changing the diapers and all that sort of stuff, cuddling and so forth. It feels good to us to do the cuddling, but it also feels, creates this oxytocin kind of thing. Now imagine a kid who you don't get that, right? You spent, you do it, you do it constantly and it just isn't, working or doesn't work very often or wasn't work enough and so forth. Well, that feedback loop, as you're suggesting, now starts instead of this virtuous dynamic system, you've now got this vicious dynamic system in the sense that the, the, the parent kind of eventually is going to run out of patience. Hopefully they ideally they'd have respite and they'd have other people to help and so forth and so on. But without that, it just, you know, that, and then that state in the caretaker reinforces that 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 uh, agitated state in the infant and you've got the feedback loop going in that direction well rinse and repeat hundreds of times right and and you've got the situation where it's like it's just really difficult to get through life in an unagitated state the other version the virtuous one is that well eventually you learn how to do some self-soothing right you learn how to how to take care of yourself i mean mindfulness frankly is a much more sophisticated way of doing self-soothing, right? Um, it's uh, mm -hmm. and often very effective for people who get good at it. Um, but but basically, you've got you've got some skills of your own, which is why I think that prenatal and early infancy, early childhood period, is so vulnerable because you don't have compensatory skills to help you cope with frustrating or disappointing circumstances. You're entirely open to the world in a sense, right? And when that world comes at you with love. Then you begin to build up a basic frame from which you can then do lots of things. When it comes at you with harshness or difficulty or unavailability, often through no choice of the parents, they just overwhelm themselves, right? Um, then that's the world you're prepared to see and prepared to act in. Um, and it may be that that stands you in good stead in the short run, right? Don't take anything from anybody and, you know, Hit first is always a good rule, right? In those circumstances, and so you you wind up in the, in that situation. And I think we need to um, those dynamic systems across time. I think that's uh, there's some very interesting in new work uh, and new thinking going on. That from a developmentalist's perspective, we've really got to understand the dynamics of those systems over time. It's not just what does this kid look like now or, or whatever. It is really understanding how those things are interacting to sustain it and dynamic systems like many you know sort of in, in physics and chemistry and lots of other things 
once you've got a stable dynamic system, it's harder to change, right? That's the way it's organized. And there's lots of things that pull it back to that root. Escape velocity is hard to achieve from problematic early, uh, early sorts of things. So also, if you've got a really strong base, it, it would take quite a hit to knock you off that into a more, <laughs> the more negative thing, right? So you, the, the, the ability to push that system positively for negative dynamic system history, it, it, it's a big lift, right? That's why we're not as successful at it as we'd like to be. And that's why, of course, everybody now, I mean, that's, this is not why, but I think it explains it, is it the big push to get it right early on because that's where you've got more levers. There's more things you can do to make it shift it off of that path, right? At the beginning, it's wobbly. It could go either way. If you can shift it early, it's relatively easy. The more the diverge, the harder it is to get to get to a different thing. It's never impossible, but it's it just gets harder the more it's locked into a particular way of being in the world. So at those very early stages, what kinds of changes do you think might make a big difference? I mean, uh, you know, I talked to Sarah Hurdy about the decline of alloparenting and, and how uh, parents often find themselves um, tasked with uh, a lot of responsibilities that they, they, they find find it difficult to fulfill. Um, you know, is that one possible change that we could think about? Uh, I know in Sweden, what they've done is they have, rather than having, giving mothers um, uh, leave to have their child, they give them pregnancy leave. So they, they begin their leave much earlier on because there's evidence that just going to work and working, you know, in an environment that, that is, is very demanding can, can, uh, create a lot of stress in the mother. Are there some, some interventions, that, po policy interventions that can be done to reduce the, the impact of, of stressful motherhood or parenthood? Uh, and are there things that individual parents can do themselves to, to minimize the, the impact of, of, of these, uh, these changes? No, well, I, there, I, yes, I think there are. I think that, that, um, I mean, I think that Sarah Verde is in exactly the right direction, which is that you have to have, particularly for kids who are presenting difficulties, you really do have to have multiple caregivers available because it is, it is a superhuman effort and not really achievable by many people to do that on your own. Right. So I think that, I mean, the con, I mean, if we look at that from, uh, from, from taking one step back is to say, well, we really have engaged in this really rather remarkable social experiment in the West and in the United States in particular, whereby it is more important. You, it's in order to not slide down that big inequality ladder, you have to be mobile. You have to be willing to go where opportunities are. And so we created this situation where extended families, where you expect to be able to find that help uh, most readily. And in every other primate, that's what you find, right? Um, we've now, you know, sliced and diced that so that people are not in proximity, uh, frequently are not in proximity to each other. And trying to recreate that in 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 in, in uh, some kind of a social policy mold is very is is very hard to do, right? So I think part of it is we have to recognize we better get some good, um, you know, cultural prosthetics in place here to make it possible because it is uh, in isolation the nuclear family without real and I mean actual not oh we support you you know, psychologically, I mean, actual real physical support, uh, you know, it's a pretty overwhelming task, especially when sort of not falling behind pretty much implies that you should probably have both adults working, right? So mm -hmm. you're trying to coordinate two working adults uh, and with, a, with a, you know, patchwork at best child care system that's only open to individuals who have the resources for it, really. Um, and you know, uh, <laughs> referencing back to uh, my late colleague, Yuri Brodfenbrenner, is that I sometimes, is he, he said that I sometimes think that, that everybody else must just imagine that Americans only raise their children in cars, right? Because that's the only time they, they actually see them and interact with them, right? And so there's that structural piece there. I do think that allo parenting and mechanisms to support that, whatever they may be, I don't think we're going to get people to give up mobility and, you know, all stay in one place, but other ways of doing it 
very high quality infant and early child care would be a mechanism that does seem to work, right? That's there we do have some good evidence on that. Another evidence-based thing is where we've got, you know, fairly, um, you know, uh, rich uh, home visiting nurse arrangements for uh, newborns where they come by on a regular basis over the early months where the going can be the toughest for, for new parents, especially. And so that's another mechanism. There's some good, very good, you know, sort of um, uh, trials, uh, uh, well-controlled trials on that. Um, I think the things that we, that, and, and certainly trying to understand that we're going to have to make, I mean, the most obvious sort, I kind of hate to say it, but the most obvious uh, help in allo parenting is if dads will be parents, right? So if mm -hmm. <laughs> there's actually two adults there who can do exactly the same job, it's a whole lot easier if, if each person is picking up their share of it. And I, I think we're starting to move past that, although the mm. evidence on time use and so forth suggests that there's still a very substantial uh, difference in that the burden falls inordinately on the mother uh, still. But there's a dimension that you could, you could make to the sorts of things. By the same token, when we were talking before about it isn't really what the stressor is, it's how you perceive that stressor to a large extent. So if you perceive it as a status threat, it feels the same as if it were actual material threat of some sort. Um, the same is true for love, right? I mean, it's sort of like a baby doesn't know, right? I mean, they know, they know who their parents are pretty early on or who their close proximity people are fairly early on. But they're, you know, they're willing to be soothed by just about any, you know, competent holder <laughs> of an adult holder of a baby. They're happy to be soothed by that, right? So the more people that you, the more ways that you can create more people providing that kind of, of positive emotional input early on, the better you'll be. I think it's a, I think it's a big task. I mean, I, you know, you, you know, we relied on organically evolving methods for doing this for a very long time, right? Uh, into the modern era, uh, we did with villages being more involved and so forth, and for small communities and so forth. To the extent that that's all in the way out, and it, you know. I guess Robert Putnam's bowling alone suggests that we should imagine that that kind of sociability is, is not organic sociability is on the way out. We probably do need to come up with some good social policy uh, um, uh, ways of accomplishing the same the same thing. To me, that's where the big push is because all the resilience literature, uh, you know, uh, from super nurturing on, uh, says that the, the you know. The big, the big impact comes from social connection. That, that's where it comes from, right? If you want to overcome early long odds, it's social connection. If you want to try to repair things at the moment in the, in, in the present, it's social connections, right? And it can come in all kinds of ways from all kinds of sources, but you have to create, you, you know, we, our ability to see that that will evolve organically seems to no longer be a possibility because we've manufactured our environment in such a way that it's not, then what are effective ways of, su of supplying that um, in, in a conscious way, right? I mean, this is not the first time people have thought about it. I mean, kibbutzim were the same idea, right? I mean, it was like, we want to have a, we want to have a community that's raising individuals and, you know, and, and I know there's research and, some controversy about what its impact was long term that may have more to do with the specifics of how it was designed than the general idea um, of, of it potentially being valuable. But uh, it, something that allows us to do those sorts of things and, you know, sort of the high quality early child care um, and for even young kids um, combined with much more generous parental leave and a reduction in the social and work stigma of taking it. Uh, would be very important, right? So you mentioned a number of the Scandinavian countries have quite good <clears throat> paternal leave as well, or you can split it up as you would like uh, between the mother and the father. Um, uh, it's very hard. We don't. You still don't see males taking up that option very much. It's regarded as a you know that you you know it's it's the modern parental leave version of the old mommy track, right? You're not really serious if you're willing to take off six months to be involved day to day raising, you know, your, your infant, then, you know, are you really serious about your job? Mm. So these are not going to be even in the, what we regard, I think rightly as more progressive societies, it's still not a solved issue by any means from what I see. 
Well, look, I mean, there's there's a there's a segment of society where the stressors are are, are severe. I mean, we have with mass incarceration, we have uh, you know families that are fragmented and, and parents that are overwhelmed. Um, and I think there, the you know the the, the challenges are, are much greater. Um, but when we look at the the higher socioeconomic status folks, and and you know we seem to see the kind of snowplow parenting and the helicopter parenting, and so there, I don't think anyone could argue that the children are being uh, neglected or uh, they're not getting enough attention. I think studies show that mothers are probably spending more time on childcare than they have pretty much at any point in history, at least individually, you know, dietically. Um, And I I think you, you make the case that, that part of this is a reaction to the way in which the the children are um, formed psychologically, right? You talk about the kind of orchid child versus the, the, the dandelion uh, child. And so if you have an orchid child, then you kind of have to, continue to <laughs> to provide them with this this support system could could you talk a bit about that and yeah. and you know is this what, is, yeah, or I, you is, know, this a, is this a cause or a consequence yeah. of yeah oh i i think i think it's um well it goes back to the earlier thing we were talking about i think it is in many ways the snowplow parenting or helicopter parenting in the higher scs groups uh are adaptive to what they perceive as the threat. So mm-hmm. if you're in a very steeply graded society where the high people are way above the, you know, low SES and high SES are big different as opposed to flatter, right? If that's the case, if you're up here at the top, right? What's the biggest fear you've got about the world of the future for your kids? They're going to slide back down. So the only way to avoid sliding down because social mobility is you know, downward mobility is creeping higher and higher. The only way to do that is to make sure that they succeed massively, right? They succeed massively because otherwise they could slide down. If you want to put them and if you don't have, I'm not talking if you have dynastic wealth and that's a whole other set of problems that probably occur there. Small, very small end, one in the 10,000s with the Piketty, uh, Thomas Piketty definition. But, but for, for, for the, you know, run of the mill, very high SES individuals, that also puts a huge amount of pressure on those kids. You have got to succeed, mm-hmm. right? You absolutely have to succeed. If you don't succeed, you know, it gets to the point where it feels, although it almost surely in reality is not, it feels like an existential threat. You're going to lose your status, right? Our status, right? And so we need you, you need to do everything. If you don't get into one of the you know, one of the IVs or the big 20, um, you know, top rated schools or whatever, all is lost, right? Despite the fact that there's no evidence to support that, right? You know, all those studies of the CEOs of Fortune 500s and finding them coming from all manner of universities, many of which you never heard of in your life, right? Or I didn't. And, and, you know, they're not all, you know, Mm -hmm. from that top 20 schools or whatever it is. Um, the, 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 uh, that that's what your fear is. So you're, you're doing this adaptation and how much of it is, you know, it's a kind of a trade-off. There's a huge amount of attention, but it's focused attention towards achieving a certain goal. It's often not just in and of itself. Right. So that there, it comes with a, you know, uh, there's a tea, you know, there's a, there's a bit of sugar to make the stress medicine of you better succeed, go down. Right. It makes it easier to do it. And you can see how frantic you know, these parents get, I mean, this, this recent, um, college admission scandal, right? I mean, what is that other than the, you know, they're, I mean, talk about your snowplow parenting, you know, plowing, plowing, uh, you know, money there. And of course there are legitimate quote ways of doing it is, you know, you make a huge donation, get a building named after you. They're not going to turn your kid down. Right. So you've got all of that stuff going on. So I think it's a different kind of stress and, and I mean, it's it's almost a reverse, right? So for the very high SES, it's almost always status stress that's the issue. It's not obviously material stress, right? There's no concern about material insufficiency or precarity in the sense that you might wind up in material sufficiency. It's all about holding on to that status, holding, which means holding on to wealth, but still holding on to that status. At the very lower end, it's you know in the in what's you know what's called deep poverty, right? Below one on the needs to income ratio, right? That group, 
Um, Gene Brooks Gunn has some really interesting work showing that they are very substantially worse off than even those individuals in poverty one level up. And it's because it is totally consumed with worries about material sufficiency, right? That's the only thing you, which is a totally unrelenting stress. If you don't know where your next meal is, there's nothing more stressful for an animal than not knowing where sustenance can come from, right? So, so if status stress is just not an issue, right? It's all material stress. And then I think for everybody in that vast in between, it's a mix, right? It's, it's, it's some version of you're afraid that you're going to have, you're going to get your mortgage foreclosed on or something, which happened to a lot of people unexpectedly in the last, you know, in the great recession. Um, or you're worried about being unemployed and how you cover your payments and so forth and so on. So it may not be immediate material insufficiency, but it can be enough to make you very stressed as well as the status stuff that goes with it of being unemployed all of a sudden and so forth. So I think, I think it, 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 the type of it, I think changes, but I think that to the extent that, I mean, the inequality is what's making more and more people towards the bottom, unable to, you know, that they have to worry about material sufficiency. More and more people are being eviscerated into a situation of precarity, if not insufficiency. And then you've got um, the individuals further and further up where you, the parents just can't guarantee through wealth that their kids are going to not slide down. They have to make sure those kids get all of the human and social capital that they can put into them, right? So they'll, you know, spend $30,000 to have them, you know, sort of digging a well in Kenya or something to put on their, on their resume, right? That, that's what they're worried about is that their kids would, would, would slide down. I think the whole society just is amping up its stressors, right? The stress reactivity comes from two things. There has to be a stressor and you're vulnerable and not very well equipped to deal with it, right? Well, at some point, if you ramp the stressors up enough, you're almost nobody's going to have the capacity to withstand it. I don't care how much supposed grit you've got. It's going to overwhelm you, right? And the more you increase the vulnerability, the less the stressors have to be to overwhelm you. When you're increasing both, which I think we are, I think the vulnerability is increasing partly because of this kind of whole epigenetic shift that's going on. And at the same time, we're very rapidly wrapping up the stressors out of the societal structure and societal practices. And, and I think that's just such a really bad mix. You know, I think that we need to, we need to give people self-protective things and we need to change the way that we're doing this so that we're not, you know, constantly ramping up the amount of stress that everybody's feeling. Well, you referenced some of the studies and I, th I, I've, I think these studies are, are, uh, are, are pretty, pretty good that, that inequality does affect the, the overall health of the people in the society. Um, and also it's really also about the, um, perceived stability or the riskiness of, of slipping. Um, but I talked to Robert Frank, who's an economist who, who studies these things and, and he, suggests that a lot of it has to do with choosing the right pond, so to speak. Right. Um, and so, you know, if you have inequality within a society, a lot of it has to do with how you define the society, right? Like what is the point of comparison? And you talk about kind of rungs within rungs. Um, so are, are there ways to kind of change the way you think of your, your status? Um, and I'm thinking in particular when you're, you know, raising children, uh, how you, you teach them to think about status. Um, you mentioned that kids, as soon as they get to school, they start sizing one another up uh, according to various, you know, status metrics. So, you know, if you send your kid to a school where they're going to be, the, the, there's always a debate in, in um, real estate. Should you buy the, the, the nicest house on uh, a not so nice block or should you buy the, the worst house on, on, you know, the best block. Right. And um, you know, that's, that's endogenous. I mean, you can choose which, which house you buy, or you can choose which neighborhood to some extent you live in. You can choose which status markers you're going to teach your, your children to, to value and honor and which community of status they're going to spend their time. Is, is there some, some plasticity or, or fluidity with which we can think about measuring status? I mean, I think in terms of like, um, you know, immigrants who come here, they, they go from being you know, they, they're immediately at the bottom rung of the ladder, but their self-perception is one where they're kind of at the highest point of the ladder because they're comparing themselves to the people back in their, in their village who are unable to escape poverty. No, and I, and I think that it, you know, there are, there are different ways uh, to 
conceive of how inequality matters, right? I mean, and obviously the one that gets used the most because it's the readiest statistics is, of course, income um, because it's measured similarly across most of the advanced world and so forth and so on. Um, and so when, you're, when you look at that, um, at, at those data, it is clear both that, that that gradient is related to health outcomes and that the steeper that gradient is as mm. a society, the average health of that society yeah. comes up a bit lower, right? But it's also, but I think those societies are also, also ones that emphasize the income as a status marker, right? So the ones with the if, steepest inequality. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, if, for if sure. Had, yeah. Right. Right. And so, so if you look at, I mean, you know, sort of the Nordic countries are where people always go to for comparisons, but it's legit because the statistics are pretty robust um, and they do a better job of keeping all kinds of statistics, not just um, um, financial statistics. But, but one of the things that, that gets pretty clear and how it links to policy in my mind is that you have no society is flat, but you've got it flatter, right? Instead of steep, it's a little bit flatter, right? So that's one part of it. Um, Part of it is that it's, although there, you know, I don't, I mean, you would know, probably, I, I don't, but I think, I don't know that any of them have actually gone to a guaranteed basic income, but it's almost like that where most everybody, you know, has a basic level of support that, that, that they can get by. So the precarity and material insufficiency is not as big a threat, right? Even at the very, at the very uh, bottom. But I also think that you, that for a variety of reasons, part of, a big part of it, I think is status, whereas um, uh, in many of the Nordic countries and, and in Germany, the apprenticeship system is set up very elaborately, you know, in the way that the, you know, sort of what, um, uh, 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 Hall and Soskis talked about as a, you know, more, uh, 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 a collaborative social uh, relationships as opposed to a liberal market economy and so forth is that there is less negative status associated to, with being something other than a top professional or a manager or whatever, right? So that being a tradesperson is 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 perfectly honorable. You're quite right. secure in it, right? There's a good social safety net. If for whatever reason your particular company goes out of business, you'll probably wind up fine somewhere else. And so there's no particular feeling of, you know, existential threat if I happen to lose mm -hmm. my job. And there's no, you're not better off than me because you work in a bank and I build houses, right? There's you know, I'm not saying there's none, but but generally speaking, it's not the same as in uh, uh, the societies. And I think where it's much more telling, and I think it's much more telling in more. Um, I do think that there is an association where you have the steepest income gradients are associated with having uh, much more class status awareness and much more class status concern. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, they're all you know, English speaking histories in one way or right. another is either being yeah. thrown but you can be you can be a poor politician or a poor priest or a poor graduate student and um still think of yourself as being fairly high status, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. And so you and so you can you can you can detach those things to some extent. I think just I think that sort of that whether it's one where you just, you know, vote with your feet and go to a place where you feel relatively comfortable. And that reduces your stress and so forth. Um, I think that is a mechanism that works. Um, so long as there are such patches around that, you know, <laughs> where, where is welcoming of, of that sort of thing. If you, sh if you, if you shrink those oases and make them pretty rare, then right. everybody's going to get more agitated. Um, or if you're, if you belong to social groups like churches that offer, um, social support. Right. And it's right. a sense of stability and community. That's right. And that's it can protect you, presumably, from the, the effects of the stress. Well, well, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot of literature, I'm sure you know, which says that one of the, one of the best predictors of more positive health is be, be actively belonging to a religious community and so forth. Now, what's not separated out there is whether it's because of the religious belief system gives you some satisfaction and assurance or that it's a vibrant community that you participate with on a regular basis or some combination of those, right? But there's a community part as well. I don't think we've done an RCT where we assign people to no. religious <laughs> communities. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We'll try that. No, I haven't, haven't managed that yet. Um, right. Well, 
Well, look, there's so much more in the book that we could get into. I, I just want to end with a discussion of you know, stress contagion, right? So this is right. super powerful. And, and there's a bunch of different vectors here, it seems. So it's not just sort of, you know, parent to child, um, but, it, but it's also kind of uh, lateral, right? So it's, it's from person to person in the environment where, you know, if you are, um, if you, if you have dysregulated stress, then you're going to essentially, um, spread that to the people around you. Right. Um, but also I think it's, 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 it's done through media. It's done through communication. I like to think of the, the stress industrial complex, right. Which is constantly picking scabs and, and, uh, you know, uh, reminding us of our own precarity and, and alerting us to all sorts of yeah. dangers and blowing them out of proportion, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you know, one person has one bad thing happen to them 5,000 miles away. And all of a sudden, you know, our reptilian brain thinks that this is an imminent threat. Yeah. Um, you talk about mindfulness practices and, and ways that you can not only, uh, as, as a, as an adult, but also as, as a, as a young person, um, kind of master this, this reactivity and create a bigger gap between the stimulus and the response. Um, is this, how, how does one do this? How is, is, is it just to kind of tune out, uh, the stimulus, know ahead of time, which stimulus is going to, uh, lead to this reactivity or is, is it about kind of exposure therapy where you, you expose yourself as much as possible to it. And so until you realize that it's no longer a threat, right. And then see some kind of extinction of the conditioned response, how, how what's, what's the best way to, to approach this? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of possible analogies and I think some of them are, are so and some are less. So a one quick link I would make though is, is in thinking about that, um, because it leads into this is that when you think about what is the kind of contagion that we that we do and how do we promulgate it in a, you know, in a variety of ways. I think fundamentally what we've started to move into is people have often talked about we've shifted away from an industrial and even beyond a post-industrial economy into a kind of a knowledge economy. But where I like to think of it is it's an attention economy. It's who gets how many eyeballs, who gets how many people paying attention to what's going on and so forth, because that's the vector through which uh, increasingly mercantile exchange takes place, right? So there's some recent papers out very interestingly on market cognition and how we've come to think in terms of, of all this. And so if we're talking about an attention economy, well, if I'm trying to make money in an attention economy, what I'm going to try to do is to figure anything I can get to get your attention. You know, And generally speaking, because emotions and especially negative emotions, with the exception of sex, are ones that have an instant hit, right? you know, that's what clickbait is made for, right? It's, it's, it's to grab you with the most outrageous or unusual or something. Well, right? And partic particularly if you're primed to be very sensitive to, to potential threats, exactly, right? Exactly. Exactly. So that's, so in a sense, think of it that way. So there's this kind of emerging attention market economy that's trying to grab as much attention as it can. In a sense, mindfulness is the opposite of that, is that I'm not going to willingly give my attention over to anybody until I've decided that this is something that it's worth using my mind for. And so it's not to obliterate awareness, right? You're still aware of, of everything that's going on. I'm not an expert. I, I, I confess right off the bat, I don't teach it and I'm not that great at it myself, but I work at it a bit, but, and it does take work. That's the other thing is again, it's not a clickbait kind of thing where here are the four steps and then you're mindful it, it, it you know it takes it takes creating a new habit basically you have to create a new habit and it's really i mean it is kind of being in the present being aware of what's going on in the present not being overwhelmed by the past not being consumed by regret or resentment or ruining things that have happened you certainly look back to learn from what's happened right to understand more of where you are in the world now and it's also not overly concerned with the future. Obviously people do planning and that's a good thing, but you're not fearful or anxious. You try to re reduce the amount of catastrophic thinking. If uh, this doesn't happen, mm -hmm. then this cascade will come down all over me and it'll be the end of things, right? So you're trying to maintain, and why it's hard, is maintain a balance to be aware of the past and the future, but to maintain a presence of mind. That's, I think, where the phrase comes from, a presence of mind that I'm thinking choosing to think about this. You can, you know, you can do all the razzle dazzle you want in the background, but I'm not paying attention unless 
you know, I think it's worth my focus at this moment in time. And I bring my focus down the things that I'm actually experiencing now, mm -hmm. even in the physical sense. What am I hearing, tasting, seeing, you know? All those sorts of things are things that will make it to me. Mindful eating is a good example. I'm thinking of all of the things that led this to be here and then how it's, I'm experiencing it at the moment. To my mind, that's the, that is the best and maybe the only personal antidote to this ravenous attention market economy that's emerged, um, that's trying to grab our attention all the time, which is not to say that I think even well, I shouldn't say the most mindful people, but even people who are pretty good at it, you know, you can't do it. You know, it's all the time, right? You have to set some time aside to do it because sometimes you're just out there being buffeted by the waves or whatever's happening at that point in your life or in the day or what comes across your screen or whatever. Right. Um, so it's not, it's not that you're being, you know, kind of, uh, it's not, it, 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 Self-regulation and mindfulness in my mind are very similar to each other. It's the ability to see what's it, what do I want? You know, what do, what are my goals? What is my purpose? Right. What am I trying to do? And, and not being unduly knocked about by the world in, mm -hmm. in, in, in carrying that forward. To be able to do that, you have to have a calm enough center, which is why it's hard for stress dysregulated people to get there because their center is pretty dysregulated. So it's, you have to start small and try to hope that it grows out from that small star, right? Um, which is, I think, one of the reasons, by the way, why social connection is a more tried and true resilience producer compared to mindfulness, because it others can take actions that help you towards that resilience path. For mindfulness, you need to kind of emphasize that, and it's kind of a workaround so that you you can decide: do is this worth having a reaction to or not? Right? It's not and instantaneous and I'm flying off in fight or flight, uh, I, I'm saying, is this worth my energy, right? Is, is this something that fits with what I want? And that's, you know, I mean, that's hard. Nobody does it all the time, right? But I mean, but that, that's in a sense what I think of mindfulness as and why it's so, why it is potentially so valuable and important to get a self-regulatory or mindful stance as our world continues to evolve in this way. Because you know, well, I mean, th from a data science point of view, the AI mech algorithms for grabbing attention are getting better and better and better faster than we can even imagine, right? Or maybe you can imagine better, but, you know, the, the algorithms for grabbing my mind are a lot faster than my mind is in resisting them. So I need to have a center that says I'm not going to be driven by those external algorithms, whether they're of a material sort or just an attention sort. Now, look, it. I teach managers for a living and these people are, you know, we're probably not going to run entire societies, but they're going to run these little societies. I mean, families, of course, are even smaller societies. And I think most of us run families. Very few of us run societies, but a lot of us will run companies. Um, and, and it seems to me like when you're running a company, you have an income statement that's visible and then you've got this invisible income statement. And part of the invisible income statement is the impact that you have on the health and well-being of the people who work in the organization. And, you know, I've, I've had a toxic boss. I've had someone who is, uh, and, and, you know, toxic bosses, there's a lot of different definitions. One of which is that they cause people to quit, right? They cause people to attrit, but, but even the people that don't attrit, they're impacted in a, in a very negative way. I've, I've seen people seek out hospital, uh, attention, you know, going to the hospital for stress and anxiety and, and you see this kind of cascade as it ripples through the, the community. It ripples through the employees and the employees' families and the employees' children. Um, and, and oftentimes people seem, the, the, the superiors seem to be unaware of the, the toxicity of some of these, these people. And, and you mentioned that. You mentioned how, you know, a bad boss can, can shorten the lifespan of, of dozens of people, uh, through this contagion effect. Right. Um, how do we make people more aware of the impact of this behavior on other folks? How do we make people aware of the, the fact that this is not simply a problem uh, that individuals need, need to manage for their own well-being, but something that they need to manage for the well-being of all the people that they impact in their lives? So this is not an area which I have uh, much experience at all. But I think one of the things that whether we're talking about a corporation or a company or any other kind of, you know, largest organization that requires a lot of, you know, coordination and so forth. And some people who are in charge of 
trying to make that run smoothly. I think that one of the things that we, um, my sense is that it's very hard, particularly if it's a profit driven enterprise, like a corporation is to, um, persuade people that it's of sufficient importance to try to create a more healthful, less stressful climate. I don't think they're going to do it just out of the goodness of their hearts. I think you need to show that in fact, these kinds of practices lead to better outcomes and the outcome that, you know, that people are concerned about is income and, and we judge it in those things. Part of the problem there is that, and, and it's not just in corporate settings, but it's broader, I think, than that. Part of the problem there is that our metrics for what we look at for success and over what time frame we look at success is often too short and too narrow. So all we're looking for is these particular kinds of things, because we know that toxic bosses often get results showing up on income statements pretty routinely, right? You know, they, they, they can enhance for a short period of time. The question is, does, is that a sustainable uh, kind of growth, mm -hmm. right? So partly I think biz schools and, and the way capitalism operates on the fly these days is so fast that you actually can't see what those impacts are. Of course, if you're business model is creative destruction and every company is only destined to have a 10 year lifespan. Anyway, you may not care, but, but the reality is I think that these have these have these kinds of effects The the, um, what those climates would look like. There are organizations where we studied it much more closely because we have a different kind of vested interest. We've looked at school climate a lot. We've studied school climate a lot, right? And we know a lot about it and we know it, you know, um, and I'm trying to go all mystical here, but we know when we've walked into a toxic workplace or a toxic school or a toxic childcare or whatever, I mean, that's a little extreme, but you know what I mean? It's, you, you get a feeling when there's a vibe in the room, that's mainly tension and you pick it, we're animals. We pick it up right from watching other animals, like how they react, how they are around each other. Some people study this carefully and use it manipulatively or just study it to understand it. All those sorts of things are ways of conveying that the climate in this place is either supportive of people and expect them to do well, or it, it's not. And it's very like in schooling. And I think in the corporate sector, uh, uh, my colleague, Tom Berloon, who did anthropology and business, um, it, it looked across different kinds of societies. Um, and, and essentially is that it has a lot to do with what's the nature of the uh, parenting or attachment style. So if you have a school whose principal and whose leadership are warm and supportive and responsive, but have high expectations, their kids do well, just like that's true in families. And Tom showed that that's pretty much just what happens in corporations. If people feel supported, they feel like people respond to them. They perceive procedural justice in the way things are decided. And yet they are, that is the, when they will rise to meet the expectations that people have of them. Right. And the opposite, you know, the more authoritarian kind of model doesn't work in families doesn't work in schools and doesn't, I think, work generally in corporations for any length of time. And so I think part of it is that if we think of these things as, uh, as, as largest social organizations that we're trying to get organized to do certain things, there are ways to do it that, you know, there are different ways of doing it. I do also think though, that it's, we need to step back and say, what's the metric that we most care about, right? So if our only metric is market success, then that's what we're going to focus on. And we're going to have more of that stuff going on. My view, at least as a society, it would be much wiser to put metrics of population developmental health at the center. And then you think about, okay, well, what kind of regulations are there to protect people from toxic bosses? What kinds of labor relations are we going to tolerate in our society? What kinds of, of uh, social safety net are we going to have so that people can leave a toxic work environment and not figure they're out of work for the rest of their lives. There are other choices out there. They can, you know, there are lots of other possibilities. So I think if you give people some uh, direction and freedom, and then you also say certain things, you know, just can't happen. I think the fact that we, uh, you know, have so valorized and prioritized bottom line market metrics as what's a successful society and so paid, relatively speaking, so little attention to developmental health at a population level, 
that we have this kind of imbalance. And exactly how do we get from A to B is the million dollar or trillion dollar question. But I think that's where it lies. I think that's where the that's where the potential control levers are that you can move these things around. Well, Dan, thanks so much for joining me. This um, is a great introduction to kind of social epigenetics. Uh, it's a great introduction to kind of stress contagion, great introduction to uh, raising children, uh, teaching children, uh, and uh, working with adults. I mean, it goes through the whole life, lifespan of people and how uh, stress impacts us and impacts our health and longevity well-being, and happiness. Thanks so much, Dan. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 